It's a great pleasure today to have Lucas Schmidt from MIT. Lucas is a postdoc postdoctoral research fellow at MIT. Uh, before that, he did his PhD and uh, also spent some time as a research fellow at ETH Zurich. And he's got a lot of awards and nominations, including uh, his um, ETH Medal for outstand Outstanding PhD Thesis and ETH Medal for Outstanding Master's Thesis and Willy Studer Prize for Best Master's Graduate of the Year and the Swiss National Science Foundation postdoc. Uh, Lucas has been very active in modeling uh, ma and mapping dynamic scenes for robot perception and navigation. And what's impressive about his work is that he does a lot of uh, great modeling and uh, software engineering to realize them, but also implement them on real hardware robots. And he's done a lot of work on drones and using drones for mapping and navigation. And today, he will talk about Kronos, which is his latest creation. And it's about uh, semantic, spatial, te uh, temporal semantic mapping uh, in dynamic environment. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Mani, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing um, throughout my PhD at ETH, but also at my postdoc at MIT, um, together with uh, all of my fantastic students and collaborators. And today we'll be talking about some parts of the research. In particular, we'll be focusing in a bit more detail on um, perception and mapping in dynamic scenes. <clears throat> So to start this all off, I want to take a step back and take a little broader perspective with the observation that we humans can do fantastic things in the world. We are really, really adept at seeing what is around us and building a mental representation, really, that allows us to achieve complex tasks such as navigating highly dynamic environments, manipulating very complex objects around us, and even understand the world to a degree that allows us to um, explain what happened in the past and predict how it's likely to evolve. So inspired by that, we would want to have similar scene understanding capabilities for our autonomous robot robots. And having these kinds of world models really would be crucial to a lot of applications. To just list a few of them, we've been looking so far into search and rescue and disaster response scenarios. We've been thinking about industrial inspection and maintenance kind of tasks. Recently, we've been focusing much more on home service and consumer kinds of robots. And interestingly, a lot of the challenges that we do face in robotics are actually the same ones we also see in a augmented and virtual reality. So um, actionable perception is crucial for a bunch of applications. But what do we really mean if we say actionable perception, right? So think of the standard robotics task, of like some robot here, um, a drone in environment. And the robot has to fulfill some kind of task here. For example, it wants to make a coffee. And very similar to alluded to before, we want this robot to sense the environment. It then builds a mental representation of that environment through a process which we call mapping, as you've heard in this class. Um, we can use this map representation in order to do planning, figure out how the robot wants to solve the task. And finally, we execute the task and achieve a desirable outcome in the real world. So for today's talk, we will be focusing on this very specific bubble about how do we build maps and world representations that are actually useful to do planning, that are rich and expressive about the world, that the robot can use to do planning. I'm going to show some examples of how to plan for this. One key aspect that I want to highlight is uh, the focus of today's presentation will be on we want to bring these robots into the human environment. A lot of applications I've shown before require the robot to interact in scenes that are shared with human, and these scenes are typically highly dynamic and highly complicated. So if we look into our classical robotics autonomy pipeline, we want our robots to be interactive, to do this mapping planning kind of things, it will look something like this. We, on the right-hand side, do have our system, which is the robot on the one hand, but also the scene on the other. We see some examples of different robots, different scenes that we've worked on. Then the robot will get 
the sensor measurements and we build a map in a perception module where we usually want to build a volumetric map. I think you looked into volumetric perception for occupancy maps to represent surfaces, free space, and also the semantic attributes about the scene. So the robot has all the knowledge it needs to know to stay safe and navigate and act in these kinds of environments. Finally, we take this very useful volumetric representation that we have built and we apply it to some planning task where the plan is then fed back to the robot to execute. While this can be any sort of planning task, today I will be mostly talking about the special task of active perception, where the robot gets to figure out where do I need to gather data in order to build nice world representations. Now, if we take this standard sense, plan, act cycle and put it into highly dynamic environments, there's a couple of things that are missing, in my opinion. First of all, for the perception module, it needs to be aware of the dynamic objects that are moving around the robot. In addition, these dynamic entities tend to interact a lot with the scene, which causes changes in the scene. So the robot should also be able to understand long-term changes and its past <coughs> based on its map representation. Finally, if we have this spatiotemporal understanding, it's usually not sufficient to just be purely reactive based on what the robot has seen, but ideally we should be able to predict how the scene is likely to evolve in order to be very effective in our task planning. So this covers this entire range of spatiotemporal perception where we need to understand the present and what is currently moving. We should be able to include the fact that there is a past history of things that should be represented as well. And we want to be able to infer things about the future based on what the robot has seen. The final aspect that I sort of um, look into in my work <coughs> is that of, since everything is so dynamic and changing all the time, we would want both the robot world representation, its map, as well as its perception modules to improve and adapt over time. So for today, I'll be looking in a bit more detail into this first box of a long-term perception. I'll also tell you a bit more how things work under the hood. We'll highlight some research work. It will also show that uh, the tools you've learned so far in this class can really be applied to cutting edge research problems and do really cool things. And then we'll give a brief highlight about how we can extend this through prediction and active perception planning. <clears throat> now, let's get started with scenes that are shared with humans are really, really challenging for classical volumetric mapping approaches. Some of the challenges include that usually human environments are very, very complex and have intricate geometry, which emits sensor noise can be very hard to reconstruct, such as here, like the thin structures, like the chair. In addition, there's the problem of spatial consistency where your state estimation may drift over time. And this is really not well reflected in most um, current volumetric mapping pipelines where you get these artifacts that are called spatial inconsistencies, meaning a single point in the real world is represented at multiple points in the robot map. <coughs> Third challenge, we do have dynamic objects here. I call them short-term dynamic, meaning they are moving right in front of the robot. And if we just perform a state-of-the-art reconstruction algorithm on this, this is what we will get, all sorts of artifacts. It won't look great. Finally, as alluded to earlier, we also have these long-term scene changes, whereas if the robot's perception system are not aware of these kinds of changes, we get all sorts of artifacts from old objects not being completely removed, new objects not being accurately captured, and different objects being merged together. Now, <clears throat> the scene itself, it's not hard enough. We have additional challenges that we want to run this all on board of mobile robots. So in order to be interactive, we need to be able to perform these perception tasks based on the limited information that the robot has available with its onboard sensors. We need to perform all the computation based on the limited compute resources we have available on board of our systems, like in particular aerial systems, this can be very limited. We want our robots to be interactive, therefore all of these algorithms need to run incrementally online and in real time. And of course, making mistakes can be detrimental, so we want our robots to stay safe and their methods to stay interpretable where possible. <clears throat> Let's get started by looking into the first work where we address one challenge of uh, mapping dynamic scenes, which is detecting which parts of the scene are actually moving. So here we see a robot with a LiDAR moving through a crowded environment. We want to figure out which parts of the environment are actually the moving objects here shown in color. And there is a couple key challenges to this because we <clears throat> currently have two main families of approaches. You can either take appearance-based methods, you train a neural network on what objects that move typically look like in your sensor data, for example, pedestrians, and you apply it to your LIDAR and hope you find the right objects. 
However, what happens if you get out of distribution objects such as this person carrying a surfboard? Will it still be detected? Will it still be reliable? We don't know. On the other hand, there are geometry-based approaches where, for example, you perform ground plane removal, cluster together all your objects to figure out which are the moving objects. But these approaches break down if you have complex geometric environments such as stairs or multi-level floors. <coughs> So in order to address this, we thought we are already building a volumetric map. So can we actually use the map that we built online as a geometric motion queue to detect moving objects? And the key idea is really, if we observe a voxel or a piece of space to be free with very high confidence at some point, we know that space must be free, and any point that moves into the space that used to be free must have moved, because we know it wasn't there forever. However, if we just take an occupancy map and we apply this logic, it's very easy to get some of the cell classifications wrong and the results look disastrous. So what we came up with, we essentially estimate on the go the high confidence free space areas here shown in purple, uh, which leaves us also some low confidence free space areas here shown in teal. And the key idea is really here, we can take the sensor points, we take all the ones that fall into the high confidence areas, and then we grow these seeds to recover the areas from the low confidence points to get all our dynamic points. Once we have all our candidate detection, here shown in red, we can actually perform spatial clustering to figure out which of these points are individual objects and also track these through time. And what is really cool about that is since we know which parts of the scene are dynamic, we can actually integrate this directly into our volumetric mapping pipeline. So here we see a state of the arch approach, which is a not dynamic object aware, and we get all of these challenges. If here these trails that are not correctly being erased from the map, we have like some prior artifacts from previous observations, or also objects that are moving, but we currently don't see them in the map, which is clearly a safety hazard. However, if you use this dynamics-aware integration, we actually end up with a much, much cleaner 3D reconstruction, and we can figure out which objects are moving as the robot moves around. I very briefly want to show some details here to give an insight on how this works. So we are here looking at the detection performance on how many points in our sensor do we correctly classify as moving, and we are looking through four different scenes and a summary at the end. So if we look at the um, performance of our geometry-based, incremental map-based motion detection, we see we actually get like fairly high numbers, around 83 points IOU. If we then compare against very recent learning-based approaches, there is one approach that essentially privileged was trained on this specific domain on the, the holdout sequences of the data set, so it knows what the dynamic objects in this scene look like, and it ends up getting a slightly worse performance than our appearance agnostic version. In addition, if we look at other state-of-the-art learning-based approaches that were trained on different domains that were hard to retrain on our specific domain, even though many of them, for example, have seen autonomous driving scenes where there's also a lot of pedestrians, they really do not translate well or even fail completely when applied to a new environment. And one observation that we found particularly interesting is if we look at the final version up here, which is essentially taking all the point clouds, it takes all the time in the world and has complete information, full hindsight, to then build a map and detect the moving objects. We see actually that our incremental online version can get very close to the full hindsight of that um, <coughs> offline reasoning method. Another thing that is really important about this here is we want to run this on mobile robots, right? So we look into computation time where we see again the different data sets and we see two columns each where once we have infinite maximum range, we just integrate all the data into our dense volumetric map, which can actually be a lot of distance, up to 150 meters in some data sets, or we compare against a range where we just into care about 20 meters of distance around the robot. And what's really cool is that a lot of the aspects of this pipeline actually um, orange and blue have constant time scaling, so it doesn't depend at all how large your scene is. The only thing that scales cubically, as you've seen in the lecture, is that of building the volumetric map, here shown um, in gray and in green. However, if we truncate our distance to a maximum of 20 meters, we know there is a hard upper boundary of how long this method can take to run. And we can actually run this at up to 17 frames per second on a CPU only. <coughs> And what is really cool, since we already spent all of the great time to build our volumetric representation, we only need to spend an extra 40% of CPU to get the dynamics in there. And this is what the approach looks like in practice. Here we have a 
sensor moving around, and we see this agnosticness to object shape, where we really see um, a ball being kicked around, people carrying various objects that are correctly being detected as moving objects in all sorts of challenging environments. We have the uh, staircase kind of scene, where we still get very few false positives. Or people carrying various objects, such as a surfboard or a <coughs> cardboard box that might be hard to detect otherwise. Even like on multi-level floors, environments, this approach can still perform reasonably well. And this is pure geometry. Right now, no learning. We can go really far by leveraging what we know about geometry. Now let's address the second problem about longer-term operation where we want to build long-term volumetric maps that are consistent with respect to these changes that have evolved in the scene. So we here have an environment. Um, at two different time steps, I just call it day one and day two in this example. And here's a bit of an extreme case, but naturally some things will change. Maybe the furniture gets rearranged, maybe some objects get moved around. And again, if we apply state-of-the-art volumetric dense reconstruction approaches, this is what we get. We see like a, the new objects are not well captured, artifacts of old objects remain around, different objects get merged together, it's a mess. So what do we do about this? The key idea here is the observation that the world usually does not change at random, right? It's not individual voxels flipping from being occupied to not being occupied, but there's some sort of semantic consistency to this, right? It's either an entire chair that is being moved around or an entire table that is being moved around. So we thought, can we actually leverage this to do online volumetric mapping? And we came up with a map representation that is essentially a compositional representation. We built a lot of individual submaps that capture semantic entities, and all of them together form the whole map. So here I briefly want to introduce some key ideas where each submap here shown in color represents a specific object. We build a spatial index to be able to very quickly figure out which objects are relevant. The submaps themselves have a bounding volume, so it's very easy to globally figure out which part of representation is relevant to a specific point in space. Then we further divide the hierarchy into allocating blocks where they surface, and the surface or the blocks themselves contain the TSDF voxels, which is the actual information about where there is surface and where there is free space. And what is nice about this, it's very hierarchical, so we start from the top with a lot of submaps, but very quickly we only get the relevant geometric information. It's a by construction data parallel, so we can process all of these submaps in parallel on different threads, and it's perfectly thread safe. And as already mentioned, we can embed this idea of local consistency into the representation. Now, this is all really cool. What do we do about it? We actually also build like a perception system that can build and maintain this proposed map representation in real time. So here we see a scene being constructed, and each color represents a different submap or a different locally semantically consistent entity. We follow the panoptic segmentation paradigm of looking into different object instances. We look into different background classes. And we also separately reconstruct the free space such that all of the submaps together form our complete volumetric scene representation. In order to build the individual submaps, we perform panoptic segmentation on each of the input point clouds. We track it with respect to the scene labels. We then separately reconstruct the geometry for each object and estimate which part of the geometry is likely to belong to that object. And what is really important is that um, once we lose consistency of this object, we don't see it anymore, we stop updating the submaps so we make sure we don't accidentally um, deteriorate the quality if something has changed. So we know all of these local submaps are consistent. And what is now cool about that is we can actually do reasoning about changes on this abstract level of individual submaps rather than the surface elements. So we see in green here what the robot currently sees. And all of the submaps that geometrically agree with our current observations here shown in light blue, we can assume they are still present and they are still relevant. On the other, if there are submaps that disagree with the current observations here shown in red, we can remove these submaps as a whole and make sure we don't leave any artifacts around in the scene. And this is what the resulting reconstructions afterwards look like. So we see here um, a classical TSDF-based reconstruction compared to our panoptic submap-based map representation. We are actually able to show that new objects are captured very accurately, old objects are removed as a whole, and also like different small objects are reconstructed individually, and we can perform change detection, not just merge things together. 
I'll also do a very brief excursion about how does this really look in terms of reconstruction performance. So what we see on this graph is essentially the robot going back to the scene on day two, and it has a prior map from day one. We see in the top column the average reconstruction error, so we want the error in our 3D model to be as low as possible, and we see in bottom the coverage, so how much of the surfaces of the scene do we really have represented in our environment. And the one argument you hear very often is, oh, you can, we can just not care about changes. Let's start build a new map from scratch. And this is what this dashed green line looks like. If we just start naturally, the coverage is low initially. As we see more, we see more. And the reconstruction error is always relatively low. It gets a little bit higher once we see more complex parts of the scene. The other option that we have is we say, OK, we just take our previous map and apply state-of-the-art dense reconstruction techniques. And this is what the results look like. So first of all, naturally, we have much higher coverage because we reuse all of our previous information. But we also pay for this in a much decreased uh, reconstruction accuracy because a lot of the uh, elements of our map may have changed and are not accurately captured. Two things that are worth pointing out also is the two lines never meet. So there is some overlap on things that we have only seen on day one. And by just completely discarding day one, we will never be able to record that information solely on day two. On the other, there's also some overlay, uh, observation overlap between um, the objects that have changed, right? For example, if there was a table and I come back on the second day and I just see that half of the table isn't there, uh, for us humans, it's very intuitive to know that there's no half tables flying around. But in a voxel-based reconstruction framework, this is exactly what you see. You get these object artifacts that remain in your map and decrease your reconstruction accuracy. Now, if we enter O framework here shown in blue with a ground truth segmentation, so it's also a bit of a privileged approach, this is really the performance that we can get. We see that uh, we immediately reuse a lot of the information that we had before, which gives us a much higher um, coverage, this was the things that I showed in light blue. But also we see that by reusing the information that is consistent, we are actually able to use that information and get up to the, the high performance. Similarly, because we don't use objects that we don't have or haven't observed to agree with what we currently see, we get consistent high reconstruction accuracy. And it also remains consistently low since we don't have these artifacts flying around. And now what I personally find really cool about this, if we run this with a really noisy real segmentation network, we actually observe almost the same performance compared to ground truth segmentation. Um, a final feature, or second final feature that I want to mention about this map presentation is that it is inherently multi-resolution, right? So if you think about doing scene reconstruction at different granularities, at different resolutions, here rather coarse 20 centimeter to a very fine two centimeter resolution, we see that naturally the reconstruction error decreases as we get a higher resolution reconstruction. However, you've also seen in the lecture this cubic scaling that the memory consumption just goes up a lot. However, for our framework, since we have all of these individual submaps, we can reconstruct all of the submaps at a different resolution, which will actually net us something like this, where we get very high reconstruction accuracy at a much, much lower memory footprint. And what's also really cool about that is because the resolution is semantics inspired, we know we don't need to reconstruct the wall at a high resolution because it is a wall. We actually perform very favorably to a sensing-based multi-resolution um, reconstruction approach. So here, it's a multi-resolution approach that says we have high resolution where we get a lot of data. And we're able to show we can get up to twice the accuracy at the same memory um, consumption, or we can achieve up to 23 times less memory consumption when using, uh, achieving the same accuracy. And the last bit I already alluded to, you get the resolution where it matters. If you know you want to interact with certain objects more than with others, you allocate them in high resolution. Final feature of this approach that I think is pretty useful <coughs> is that we can actually do um, online mapping and change detection in real time. And we can here see what the robot has currently observed. This temporal notion of a red and blue is what the robot currently has seen. We see in shaded what the robot has seen before. And we can deduce that here the legs of the table, although we haven't seen them this time because we see the tabletop and we know our previous uh, reconstruction of the table must be there by semantic consistency is still occupied. Now, how do we put all of this together into a single framework where we have robots moving around humans with these short-term dynamics? 
And we also have humans interacting with the scene here in these long-term dynamics and changing the scene. To do all of this together on the robot is a problem that we call spatiotemporal metric semantic slam. I'll briefly go into the key aspects of the approach. So first of all, we have this spatiotemporal part. We want to represent the scene at all times and its evolution through time and get these consistent representations. On the other, we want to build a dense metric semantic reconstruction that gives us the surface information for the robot to act with and the object level scene understanding. And finally, there's this aspect of simultaneous localization and mapping where we want the robot to also estimate its poses and get a spatially, globally consistent estimate and run all those things incrementally on the robot. So if you think this is a fairly hard problem, I fully agree. And this is how we think about solving this. So first of all, we can pose this as a probabilistic maximum posteriori estimation problem where we care about uh, our objects, where all objects, and the background is included here, are actually summarized in this variable. If for each object i, for each time step t, we have a representation of that object that contains its surface, omega. So this can be time varying, objects can deform. We have a pose, this can be time varying, objects can move, and we have the semantic label, which for now we consider to be constant. Furthermore, we want to estimate the robot poses X, and we want to do all of this given a set of scene measurements C, which um, are similar to the object structure that we try to estimate, plus some noise, varying this noise variable. We summarize everything from inaccurate depth perception to missing and hallucinated detections. And we are given some set of odometry measurements, which are similar to incremental robot motion, plus some noise. Now that I've formalized it, it's still a very challenging problem, in particular because we have a lot of variables that can change through time. They grow extremely fast as we see more objects, more space, more time, more measurements. And we have a very strong coupling between all of these variables. So in principle, this can also be thought of as a attribution of error problem, right? Fundamentally, if you take a measurement of the scene and it disagrees with your map belief about the scene, it can be that either you are in the same place at the same time, but actually your measurements are just noisy, or you're actually in the right place, but you don't know it because your state estimate has drifted, or you're actually in the same place, but the place around you has changed and all of these things should be treated differently. How do we solve the problem? The key idea here is again, we introduce uh, some assumptions to try and decompose the problem. Where very similar to before with this assumption of local consistency that in math looks like that, very simply said is the drift in our state estimation is small for short time stamps, theta, delta. So we know the state estimation error can grow arbitrarily large over time, but over short amounts of time, we assume this to be good. Second, we assume that the actual changes in the scene are small for short time stamps, delta as well which also I think is a well-motivated since usually people are in a continuous motion rather than just teleporting around. Now this allows us to introduce some tricks here and illustrate in a very simple example where assume we have the square object O that we care about. We have the robot moving around with the robot poses X and it takes, we have the odometry measurements between the poses and we take these uh, depth measurements of the scene CJ. Now, as already mentioned, while the local estimation is good, globally we may have drifted and we don't get these very nice measurements of the scene. Now, how do we use all this data to make um, a good estimate? The key idea is we introduce a new latent variable Y, which we call object fragments. They are fragments of time. And the key idea is really we try to partition all of these measurements such that local consistency within each of these fragments holds. And this is very nice properties because we know each of these are locally consistent so we can actually estimate the Ys a lot better. But we can also assume that the different Ys are independent of each other so we can actually estimate them without knowing all of the other data. And what is also really cool is once local consistency break, by the way it's defined, it's never going to come back. So each Y actually depends only on a small subset, C bar and phi bar, of our measurements. And for the same reason, once we have all the measurements, we can actually marginalize this away and just reason about the Ys in the future because all Cs are captured in some Y, so they should fully specify the objects O as well. For the second part, for the global optimization, there's a very similar trick that can be played. So assuming the states or poses X um, are given, uh, if we knew where all our Ys really are, it would be fairly easy to reconstruct what the objects O should look like, right? 
So we introduce an additional latent variable, the associations between different objects or different fragments. Y, where again the same trick is played, if we know which Ys belong to our O's, we can only reason about them, which is called the frag uh, fragment reconciliation step. Now if you look at the remaining term that is still here, it's about estimating the robot poses, the poses of the Ys, the association between Ys, given the initial observations and the dormitory measurement, it looks very, very familiar to the landmark-based SLAM problem that you've heard about in the lecture. So we can actually address this as a SLAM problem. Now if you put everything together, it looks much more complicated than before, but actually has a very nice structure, where on the one side we can perform local estimation of these fragments Y, we can marginalize all this data, and we can use the local consistency to estimate them even better. We perform this global optimization in a SLAM framework to get the pose associations and deformation. And finally, we take all these partial fragments uh, of timed observations and put them together to build our spatiotemporal map understanding. So based on this insight, we also developed a system that we call Kronos, that's the name of today's talk, that is uh, organized like this, where essentially each component addresses one of these estimation problems. <clears throat> And this is what it looks like on the robot. We here see a simulated environment where the robot is moving around. We perform dense reconstruction of the background. We can again use this notion of local consistency to perform geometric motion detection, very similar to what I've shown before. So you have the local consistency of the geometry that tells us which parts are moving. <coughs> But in addition to that, we of course also perform semantic inference to have this semantic map representation. So we also add detections based on semantic classes, such as this chair here, where we extract them afterwards into these local fragments Y. And really the, the key part of our front end is to perform tracking of all these geometric motion and semantic object detections um, across each other and to guarantee that this local consistency assumption holds for all of the elements that we are tracking as well as for each vertex of the background so we don't bake in any errors due to changes. And what is really cool is in comparison to the previous work where we reconstructed everything immediately, now we just keep track of these associations and once local consistency breaks we can actually decide are these detections that are highly likely from an object that is actually existing, and what would be a good representation to capture it? So we can, again, perform multi-resolution reconstruction, but for some applications it might be fine. You say, okay, it's good enough to just know that there's an object, we don't need a dense model, or you train a NERF or your other favorite representation of these object fragments. So once we have collected all of these, how do we perform global optimization? And there is a one way to do this that you've also seen in this class, and it's via factor graph and post graph optimization. So I'm going back to the sketch that I had before. We have the robot trajectory with all of its nodes. We connect these with pose edges based on odometry, the xx edges. But now we also have this background reconstructed as a mesh. We can also represent this with sparse anchor points because the mesh itself has many, many, too many points. And we also add edges between all of these anchor points, which essentially encode in the optimization that the background should be deformed and moved as little as possible. We further add edges from the robot poses to the background, which essentially encode that the background should have the same distance to where the robot was when it observed them. And finally, going for the Ys, they are also represented as a single pose. We attach them to the robot pose graph when they were first and last seen. So when the robot pose moves around, we get the same constraint that the object should be where it was relative to the robot. But now what is really cool, we can take all <coughs> fragments that are spatially close and have similar semantic attributes and add candidate fragment associations. And similarly, we can also use inputs from visual loop closures to create additional constraints on our pose graph. And now that we have this, we can formulate this as a nonlinear least squares optimization problem. And in fact, we do formulate this as a robust estimation problem that is solved with graduated non-convexity, where this additional weight here essentially tells us, are these inlier or outlier measurements? We try to get as many measurements that add constraints to our problem without having measurements that completely break the problem. And this is really, really important, both for robust um, loop closure detection, so um, you've probably seen in the lecture, if you get loop closures wrong, your map blows up and looks really bad immediately. But it's also really important to get the associations between different objects right. <clears throat> 
So this is what it looks like in practice. We here see after loop closure, the map and the robot poses and the poses of all fragments deforming globally. Now the final piece that is missing is that of reconciliation. How do we figure out what the world looked like at all different times? And one thing, one fact that we silently dropped when optimizing the background is we don't have a volumetric representation anymore. We just kept the mesh around and we're deforming this. So in order to recover this, we actually propose an approximation of the free space based on a library of rays where you just take points of the background, the corresponding point where the robot saw it at the same time. We can store this in a hash grid so it's very quick to look up. And, <clears throat> and then for each query point, for example, this query point here, we get the corresponding ray from the background surface to the robot pose and we see if this distance of the length of the ray is much shorter than to our query point, it must have been occluded. By similar reasoning, if they have very similar range, we know the surface is still roughly where we expected it to. And on the other, if our distance is much, much larger, it means we would be looking straight through that surface, therefore it can no longer be there, and it's evidence of absence. Using this geometric verification or change detection step, which is really just a set of points, it's very quick to compute, and all of it can deform the robot poses and the background. We finally estimate when were robots present. So we here see a first fragment uh, observed for the first time, and we know the object was present because we literally saw it. If we come back, it will get a different segment because again, we have this local consistency constraint, so we also know that fragment was present at that time. Then if our association and global optimization works correctly, it will tell us these are actually the same objects, so we know it hasn't moved in between. What is really cool, even if we don't get semantic detections, we can still have this geometric verification step, which tells us the surface of that object was unchanged at the time, so it must still be present. Finally, when we come back and see that the object is no longer there, we get this uh, evidence of absence, so we know the object must have disappeared somewhere in the middle, and if we don't see anything, we're just optimistic and say it probably stayed where it is. So this is what a framework looks like if we run it on a robot here. We have an actual Jekyll robot equipped with an RGBD camera mapping this indoor environment with moving people that are interfering with the scene. And I really want to emphasize that we build this spatiotemporal understanding of the scene, which is not only our current best belief, but essentially this 4D model of the scene at all times. So here we see on the C-axis the number of objects that the robot thinks is present. We see on this axis the elapsed wall time, so how much has the robot moved around. But you have this additional novel axis about the robot's belief about the scene at different query times, um, t. And on the diagonal of this is essentially the real-time mode of the robot, right, where it's, it's current data and it's current belief. And you can see as the robot moves around, you detect more objects and the number of objects in the scene increases. We then also see a person moving around. We get this uh, dynamic object detection and we can also represent the moving objects using different representations. Here we use for just a sequence of point clouds, which is like very general and deformable. Now that the robot comes back, we will soon see a loop closure, which actually corrects the poses and the background, and we notice that this chair has disappeared, so this is this dent in a number of objects. And after a while, we discover there's also this new cooler box that has appeared, so the number of objects goes back up to the previous level. Now, if we keep information that the robot has constant and just play back its belief about time, this is what we get. We see that there were objects moving at different times, but the robot has now estimated that um, the chair and the cooler must have appeared and disappeared sometime in between. I last saw there was free space to I saw afterwards that there is a cooler on top of the table. So we see that this has changed here. Simultaneously, if we now keep the belief time fixed and just let the robot gather more data, we can actually see how this data flows back in time. We can still optimize our reconstruction of all objects in the background. We get more information, more objects, which improves our belief about the past as well. So with this, we essentially always keep this 4D spatial temporal map understanding that the robot incrementally builds. Looking into quantitative results, just very, very briefly, I'm not going to talk in this through detail, we compared against a bunch of existing methods where we essentially evaluated all the things I've been mentioning. It's like the capability to accurately reconstruct the background surface, the static objects, the short-term dynamic objects which are currently moving around, as well as detecting all of the long-term changes in the scene. And um, 
while we are doing good on all of the metrics, this is not what I want to show, but up to date, there hasn't been a framework that can even consider for all of these things. So for the first time, we built a framework that reasons about all of this in a dense representation jointly. Another thing that I think is quite interesting and important is uh, if we compare against the previous approach, we'd assumed that poses were given. If we actually have ground truth poses as shown here, we see that the change detection works really well in both cases. However, if we then use real visual inertial odometry as our pose estimates, we see that through our deformable change detection method, we only drop a little in performance, whereas the other method really takes um, a larger hit. Another thing that we found really, really interesting is that the formulation is agnostic to what kind of semantic input you are using. So we can here use um, semantic segmentation, which gives us some performance, or we can also go more towards um, language-based open set scene understanding, which gives us a very, very different set of uh, what the network believes to be objects, but Kronos will still take care of all of the geometric consistency and detect changes very well, even for these different kinds of objects. The final bit that is also important here that I want to discuss is that um, <clears throat> due to the structure that we have, it also has important computational aspects. So all of the front end estimation is by construction uh, bounded and runs in constant time, roughly around 20 frames per second. For the global optimization, there we have some scaling aspects where we see the object reconstruction in blue occasionally gives small spikes, but we can run this in separate threads, so that's not a problem. Um, the optimization itself, since we currently keep all of the fragments and background in memory forever, which allows us to um, optimize all of our data, naturally also causes the optimization to take longer as we go. Finally, we can run all of this, uh, except for the semantic detection, on a single laptop with 32 gigabytes of RAM. So these were the things I wanted to discuss for the long-term perception. I'll give a very brief overview of some of the things or key ideas that we've been doing on how to predict the future based on these data. So let's look into the problem of semantic scene change prediction, right? We have this environment, and there's a lot of things that can change. So first, we had to define what can change about the scene. You have state changes, like this armoire can go from a close to an open state. There can be position changes, objects can move around, or there can be instance changes, objects being added or removed from the scene. It actually turns out, where with some tricks, you can formulate this as a supervised learning problem, where we first build an abstract representation of the scene. Here, a scene graph with individual nodes representing individual entities. We then encode their attributes and train a graph neural network to predict which areas of the scene are likely to change, just based on this information on what is around it. And we can actually encode this as variability. The network will tell us these attributes are most likely to change. And while this is just added as an additional attribute to the scene graph, this is directly our inference pattern. So we can look at a high variability, high change, chance to change. However, it turns out this is a really, really hard problem to address, in particular because there's so many things that can change. It's a very multimodal problem where a lot of realizations are plausible, but only one of them happens. So instead of getting very high accuracy numbers, we more learn general trends, for example, uh, objects we frequently interact with, such as uh, monitors, are likely to have state changes. Um, objects we interfere with a lot, such as chair, are likely to be moved around. And small and handheld items have the highest chance of being added or removed from the scene. <coughs> now, while the actual accuracy wasn't that impressive, I think it was somewhere around 70%, what we were able to show, and that I think is really cool for robotics, is that just having this extra bit of additional um, information really helps um, an active change detection task where the robot has to move around and figure out which part of the scene has changed. So we here see a planning method that is inspired or like a, has these prior from our network compared to a globally optimal coverage path and we are actually able to be 66% faster in the test completion on average. In a very similar fashion, we can think about not only which objects are likely to change, but how are humans likely to move through these kinds of environments. Our current state-of-the-art methods mostly looked at a collision avoidance, so we care about maybe five seconds of a look ahead. But what if we want to make this really, really long? If we want to think about 60 seconds of uh, where the human moves. The key idea is, again, if we know about the semantic objects in the scene, 
and uh, the past interactions of the human, we are maybe much more likely to be able to predict which object the person may interact with and are able to predict um, non-linear paths where a person like goes to an object and then turns around instead of carrying straight forward all the time. So the approach that we've built and will be released very shortly is uh, we take as input annotations about maybe you've seen the human interact with a kettle and then with the coffee cup, we have here also the trajectory in space and we have a scene representation again as a hierarchical scene graph which has very rich symbolic information about the environment. And we decouple this problem into two steps. First, we predict which object is the person likely to interact with, where we take all of the symbolic information about room, objects, agent, structure in the scene, to then performing probabilistic trajectory prediction based on these uh, potential sequences of interactions. And this is what it looks like. We get really this probability distribution, highly multimodal on where the person is likely to be at t seconds into the future. And we can also sample from this to get some actual trajectories. How do we perform um, interaction prediction? Uh, there has been a lot of advances in foundation models and we can actually just take some of these large language models. We say, these are the elements in the scene. This is what the person has done before. What are they likely to do now? And we get a bunch of candidates. Maybe it goes to a coffee machine or a different coffee machine or a code rack. They can actually apply this autoregressively and build an ever larger tree of uh, likely interactions where again, um, all different instances of different classes interfere, like mix up a lot. Now, we can put all of these abstract interactions into a spatial graph as well, where you can here have these notes about these were the past interactions. We current have, currently have the state of the human as is now. We have the blue modes as seen before, which are the predicted positions of the objects to interact with. And now we also add the spatial information from the scene graph, which encodes traversability in places to say, these are likely places to traverse from object A to object B. And the approach to then turn these um, discrete predictions into a multimodal probability distribution is we can actually use a continuous time Markov chain model, which is essentially modeling the flow of probability mass through that graph. So you initially start with all of the probability at where the person is right now, and we can compute essentially transition probabilities based on how quick the person is moving or based on um, how long we expect the person to interact with a specific object and we'll give us this flow of probability through time and because we build a tree of interactions, this uh, update matrix is uh, triangular and we can very efficiently update that. So this is what it looks like. We see this probability mass um, spreading throughout the environment where we think the person is likely to go. It tends to concentrate around some objects where we think the person is likely to interact with for a long time. And what we're able to show is actually we can predict much longer horizon tasks with a much higher probability than existing methods. So here we see the negative log likelihood, meaning the lower the number, the higher the probability of the ground truth trajectory under our predicted distribution. So we see um, we're actually better able to capture this probability of where people are going. For the final bit, I think I still have a bit of time. <clears throat> I want to tell you about using these things for planning, and in particular, the problem of uh, active perception, which I think is a really cool problem. So um, one thing that I really love about robots that sets apart as apart from most computer vision applications is that robots are embodied agents. So we don't just get a sensor stream and build the best world model that we can based on that sensor data, but the robot can actually decide where to go, where to look, where to touch in order to get that sensor information that allows it to build the best possible world representation. So for this, there's a bunch of things you can do. You can, for example, take a sampling-based approach. It was just very briefly highlight. We incrementally build this tree of uh, these are viewpoints. What does the robot expect to see? Where should it go to? And what we proposed in this work is actually we can incrementally build this tree and we found essentially um, an algorithmic structure um, to define essentially the utility, which is a trade-off between gain and cost globally. So we can incrementally maintain this and get this global utility of how much gain will I accumulate compared to how much cost will I accumulate when going from my current location to anywhere in the tree. What is really cool about that is you can give it any objective function, for example, um, see as much as you can in a given time limit, 
and compared to existing methods at the time, you're actually able to see much more of the environment while spending the same amount of time and also the same distance traveled. So we're just being smarter about our longer horizon planning tasks. Other thing that's really fascinating about this, we can also have an objective function that tells us, try to get measurements that increase the accuracy of 3D reconstruction as much as possible. And while we observe that the other methods um, tend to leave holes in the reconstructions, we get a very clear um, model of this outside building. But also, we get very, very high reconstruction accuracy compared to other systems. And as we mentioned, it's an incremental approach that we can run on board of a fully autonomous robot that is here able to explore an indoor space. Um, another idea, I'll just be touching on some of the work that we've done that I think is tying back to what I presented so far, is uh, the importance of prediction, right? We talked about predicting how things change in the future is important for performance, but what about spatial predictions, right? So if you have a robot in an unknown scene such as here, there's just, um, one of the challenges of exploring unknown environment is the obvious, that a lot of things are unknown. So there are areas that are just uh, occluded by the sensor, they are out of reach for other things which leads to these holes in our reconstructions. And while for us humans it's very intuitive that the floor below where the robot took off is probably not a hole into the abyss, the robot doesn't know that and has to cumbersomely explore all of these things. So what we propose to do here is we actually use 3D scene completion to fill in the unknown parts of the scene and use this to guide the robot to be more efficient in its exploration. We again have components relating to both mapping and planning, and this is roughly how the key ideas do look like. We first start by modifying an off-the-shelf 3D scene completion network to run a little bit faster, so we can actually run this on the robot. And it gives us some completion around what the robot has currently seen. We then use probabilistic fusion to fuse um, all of these predictions together to get an incrementally growing scene completion. However, another thing that's really important is we don't only have these predictions, we also need to combine it with what the robot um, has observed here shown in color. So we have this difference between areas the robot is very certain about and areas the robot is more uncertain about. And then we can also use the scene completion of like essentially a scene completion aware information gain that tells the robot where to move and where to look. And we see we only get like these very local um, completions, but they're good enough to guide the robot. What is really, really fascinating about this is if we evaluate this in a home environment with maybe around 10 rooms, I think, this is what the exploration performance looks like if we take a traditional dense reconstruction and uh, the next plus U planner I showed you before this is what the exploration curves look like. So now if we had perfect information at an oracle that tells us this is the structure of the scene and we take this globally, uh, or this global planner that tries to find a globally optimal path, this is what the result looks like. So we could do much better if we knew more about the scene. And what we actually find is by adding these scene completions, even only locally, we get much, much closer to this optimal performance. So here we can really guide the robot what it should look at. And uh, one thing that I want to highlight here as well, we see here the measured volume, right? So we don't count any of the scene completion in our map evaluation. If we do this, we get like much, much faster completion rates and still retain around 95% accuracy. But this really allows the robot to measure with the same sensors much, much more area by being guided through scene completions. And what is also really interesting is it really matters how you fuse your scene completions. We take a off the shelf um, scene completion mapping framework which puts everything into one map, we actually see the performance can degrade because you can either like block the robot which is like um, too safety aware or it can even crash if it's too optimistic. Again, we strapped all of this onto a mobile robot with a depth sensor, um, a CPU, and we at this time also added a GPU to perform the scene completion for us and this is what the system looks like. We here see the robot flying around in real space, performing the scene completions as in simulation. Initially, it looks like it's not doing many smart things, but it's just like exploring the scene at different heights around its starting position, and then at some point decides it can actually observe more of the scene when moving around, and it finds a fairly efficient exploration path. 
So the final work I will be talking about today is we've heard so much about um, semantic inference and having the semantic object level knowledge about your environment being really important. But can we actually get our robots to be smarter about the semantics in their scenes? So a very classical problem here is that of domain adaptation, where you usually have some source domain with annotated data. You train your network on the data and it does really well, it's really awesome. But then you take your robot with the network into an application domain, which usually has some domain shift. It's slightly different to your domain. And all of a sudden, the network doesn't all that great anymore, right? So what is the standard approach in domain adaptation? Usually, you collect some data samples, you annotate this, and use it to fine tune your network. However, we thought, wouldn't it be really cool if we get a robot to do this fully autonomously on its own, and this is essentially the pipeline that we came up with. So if the sensor poses as before, we get an RGBD input. We then use an additional external epistemic uncertainty estimator to tell us which areas the semantic segmentation network is very uncertain about. And here it's really a quantifying this epistemic uncertainty was a key component to this working. And we can actually integrate all of this into an uncertainty aware um, semantic map. And we can then use this uncertainty as an exploration objective and build an active perception next plus you planning pipeline where the robot goes around and looks at areas that it is, uh, the network is very uncertain about. And the robot then executes this task, sees more data, and what is really, really cool is that uh, previous work that my colleagues showed, we can actually use these um, semantic map estimates, which in principle are a maximum a posteriori estimate over all of the different uh, views that we've seen, meaning they encode some sort of multi-view consistency in the semantic label. And we can actually use this as a pseudo label to fine tune our network based on these uh, labels. <clears throat> and what we found is really, really interesting. We see the performance of the segmentation network um, on the target domain, so there's a holdout test set on the target domain, and we see the robot moving around and training one, two, three times. And what's really interesting, it really, really depends what kind of data you gather. If you move around randomly, you actually decrease the performance of your network because it starts to forget about certain classes that maybe you don't see, you have this catastrophic forgetting problem. If you just look at everything, we found this is a surprisingly hard baseline to beat because if you see everything, you're pretty good at learning about everything. However, if we use this uncertainty aware mechanism, you can be much, much faster in adapting to the scene and improve iteration after iteration. What is also really, really interesting about this is if we look at the distribution, again, same error metric, what is the difference in performance of the neural network, but this time it's split between um, classes that we are very certain about, so they already had a high IOU to start from, to classes that we are very uncertain about, so they were already really poor when we started. We essentially find for areas that you already have very good prior knowledge, just looking at everything will improve things a little bit. However, using this uncertainty aware formulation, we can actually go to areas where the network was not doing well at the beginning and improve performance on these usually like most important categories. Again, we strapped this on a small robot with a really poor sensor and um, mobile hardware. So here we ran the experiments on a laptop that is right next to the robot. But if you take a slightly larger turtle bot, you can actually put the laptop on top. And this is what we get. 3D reconstruction of the scene uh, is not fantastic, but we can roughly tell where things are. Again, the uncertainty gives us some reasonable estimates that the network maybe hasn't seen a beanbag before. And also the semantic reconstruction is noisy, but is meaningful. And what we get out of this is, for example, um, maybe it's a different point of view that the network was not trained to see. And on the initial segmentation, it's essentially a rainbow firework of colors. But after setting the robot down, letting it explore and train, we actually get much better performance. Similar example here, we have a backpack that initially was classified as chair and afterwards as other prop, which is arguably more correct. Or here, this chair, which was also a bunch of different things and afterwards is correctly being detected as being a R type sofa. <clears throat> And what I found is really cool about this was the first time there was such an approach that was fully autonomous and on mobile hardware. So really took the turtle bot, you set it down, 
you hit go, it moves around, it trains, it moves around, it trains, it takes maybe half an hour, an hour, and uh, this is what we get. So with this, I'd like to wrap up. What are the things we talked about today? There's a lot of challenges in modeling these complex human-centric scenes, but we've shown some approaches, and there's other that I'm happy to talk about in more detail, and how to get these high-fidelity reconstructions, how to make it spatially consistent, how to detect motion around the robot, and how to get this long-term consistency with respect to changes in the scene. I hope I could convince you that it's important to add this temporal understanding about what is happening around the robot now, drawing on information from the past, and also predicting what is happening to get better performance. Finally, I also hope I was able to convince you that being able to actively close the uh, loop, gather the data that the robot needs, allows it to build much, much better um, representations for interaction. And I think active perception is a nice representative task because you need to reason about um, collision avoidance, global planning, safety, and um, what will you see if you look at different areas of the map. But hopefully these maps are also useful for a lot of other tasks. Finally, the methods I presented today, um, we ran them on a variety of aerial and ground robots, and they um, sometimes are seed, most of the times fully autonomously run with the sensing and hardware available on board. Since this is a lecture, I thought I will close with essentially um, what are three um, key principles that I would suggest you can take away from some of the words that I showed today to make your next work on a robot really work. One concept that showed up over and over again is that of a locality. Do you need global optimality for everything? For some things, probably yes. For other things, probably less. Uh, for other things, probably no. Um, you can reason about some things, for example, like uh, navigation or using this concept of local consistency very, very locally, which also makes your global optimization problem easier. The other aspect that I hope you take away is that of hierarchical structures, and here I'm thinking about all kinds of different structures. It can be hierarchy in um, uh, data structures and representations, but it can also be like hierarchy in algorithms. Maybe we have a hierarchical planner or a hierarchical map representation, because this is really what made most of the things fast and run on a CPU um, online on a robot. There you can also do a bunch of like um, use tools like data parallelism to make this really fast. And the final bit is I think as roboticists it's important to understand the interplay between all the different modules that your robot has. I'm not saying you should address all of them, but you should know does your state estimation change um, how your map representation looks or what is the interaction between your prediction modules and your planning modules or how does your planning data feed back to your map representation. So I think only working with both of these things <coughs> I learned that <coughs> Excuse me. Since the map is all that the robot has, what are the features these map presentations should have to plan for? And also the other way around. How do we plan for them? Speaking of tools, all of the code that I showed today um, is or will shortly be available as open source. If you want to give this a try, please feel free. It's all on GitHub. If you have any questions, I'm more than delighted to take them now or feel free to reach out after the lecture. And thank you so much for your attention. I was really interested in your first work where you were like uh, talking about detecting dynamic objects. Uh, you guys were using a LIDAR. And I wonder how you thought it would work with, you know, maybe just cameras, which is what's present on like a lot of our headsets today. Um, <clears throat> excellent question. So the answer is a little bit nuanced because essentially all of the works <coughs> that I showed today we're working on geometric data, so we either have a LiDAR, which has depth information, or we have an RGBD camera with such depth information, and then we can do a lot of this geometric reasoning. Um, for this specific approach, we need to be able to build these volumetric maps, which is very hard to do from only vision. You can do stereo matching or structure from motion, 
but uh, it's a little bit tricky. You can do monocular depth completion, which probably will take more compute than you have on the headset. So that is a little bit tricky. But there is a lot of approaches that follow a very similar idea. For example, if you do um, sparse features just between different um, camera frames or in between different cameras, you can use similar ideas of geometric consistency to figure out which parts um, are moving and which parts are not moving. So you can also do this for sparse features. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so I feel like I typically tend towards projects that require uh, a lot of engineering because I enjoy that, you know, like software engineering is just something that I enjoy a lot. Uh, and I think you can answer really interesting questions while you, you consider, you know, uh, okay, yes, this is great, but it's not very practical versus not so great, but it runs at 100 FPS or something. So I'm just curious, what's your approach to developing on projects that have to strike that balance? And uh, when do you make the decision to refactor, abstract, you know, all the, all the good stuff? Uh, excellent question, I really love it. Um, the key part you already mentioned, right, is striking the balance. I think a lot of us like coding, but you cannot spend four years of your PhD just doing coding, you're meant to output research, right? So usually um, the way I go about this is uh, I essentially have um, a toolbox. I work a lot with ori object-oriented programming for essentially modular code. And there's also a toolbox, uh, it's called Config Utilities, which is available open source if you're curious about that. It essentially gives you all of these OOP patterns that I use all the time. Essentially, you, speci you implement different modules. You essentially specify a pipeline of these are the different steps that my data takes. But then you just implement all of these modules separately and you can via config like a YAML file specify, oh, I wanna just change out that module or the other module. It's like very easy to run ablations and figure out how things work. The other um, piece of advice or two pieces of advice that I can give is that um, usually you wanna get the first running prototype as fast as possible and figure out what is actually the problem. Because 90% of the time it was not what we set out to solve. We thought, oh, this is a really cool research problem, let's do this, and turns out it was actually easy. You do the simple most things and that worked, but turns out a lot of other things don't work and had interesting avenues to be explored further. Great, thanks. Hey, uh, wonderful talk, thanks. Um, just have a question about scaling. So a lot of like the future uh, of robotics and robot learning discussion is centered around if there will be a scalable way um, for it to proceed. Um, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on some of your methods, how they can scale with data. I'm not talking about like scaling by maybe exploring more time, more frames in the same scene, but rather maybe you have access to more scenes. How can it benefit to unseen uh, other scenes, if that makes sense? Yeah. Excellent question. I think these are they're all fantastic questions. Um, I fully agree, right? Essentially, there has been a trend to larger and larger models, and if you just train the largest model you possibly can with as much data as you possibly can, it turns out to be very powerful, right? On the other, there's also the question of how generalist should a robot really be, right? It turns out like certain things are easy to train on, on less data, some things are not, but like the the prime example here are foundation models, right? You have this wonderful prior trained on a lot of data and it turns out it's really, really useful for some things. It maybe doesn't apply to um, all of the things. So instead of saying, how can we build um, a robotic system that can solve any problem, I think maybe it's a better question to say, how can we build a robotic system that can adapt to any problem, that can actually learn and specialize to a specific scene, right? If you think about consumer robots, most of what these robots will ever see is a single apartment for the entirety of their life. So it probably doesn't matter that they're not good at navigating Mars, but they better be very good at navigating that specific home, right? So I think a lot of these uh, online learning adaptation kinds of directions are very promising. Thanks. Here's neighbor. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I might have missed this. So what are the fragments uh, in your talk, and uh, like, how do you do the data association um, among fragments? Does this make sense? Fantastic question, also write down to the details. So 
the way we think about the fragments is actually not something we can really measure. We just try to estimate. It's more of an abstract concept. The way we think about it is essentially <coughs> if you take um, the object, there are continuous kinds of observations, right? So if you pass by the same object three times, you end up with three fragments where every time each of the fragments is locally consistent. So if the object were to move during the time, you would observe it. If it moves in between, you don't observe it. So this is really what the fragments are. It's this um, sequences of observations for which we know they are locally consistent. How do we associate fragments? Um, right now, we don't perform association between fragments that move. So we have association based on geometry um, in space. If the fragment is at the same place, or if the object is at the same place where we saw it before, then we're able to make this association that it's the same object that hasn't moved. Um, we don't perform instance relocalization for objects that have moved. But this is the direction we're looking into. For example, you could think of um, like training some descriptors of objects or people in order to figure out, hey, it's actually the same object I've seen before, but now it's here. But we currently don't perform that step. So uh, as I read in your paper of Kronos that uh, you use an active window approach to model the short-term dynamics and a global optimization to uh, measure the long-term evolution. Uh, the main, The main aspect in your paper that I'd, I'd seen was you emphasize on the change detection to capture the dynamics. So wouldn't using an, uh, using an event camera or any kind of spiking neural architecture uh, would unify the short-term dynamics and long-term evolu evolution together? And I know you will require a separate modality for that, but that would actually compensate for the uh, time lag that you were getting during the change detection. Um. I don't think that event cameras per se will serve, solve the long-term problem, right? Because like the big problem is really um, data association under the hood, right? How do you figure out you're in the same place with the same or changed objects and which objects have changed? So for the short moving objects, event cameras are fantastic, right? That's how they work. They generate all the events. I think right now they're maybe not quite mature enough to perform dense reconstruction, but there's a lot of algorithms that essentially learn sort of classical SLAM formula formulations based on events, so that's definitely the idea. I don't quite see how an event camera would help you if you go back to the same place, close the loop, and things have changed, um, how you would associate these events between earlier events that still seems like a challenge to me. Uh, so for the dense uh, reconstruction thing, you can just use event cameras to detect the associations which have changed. And then you can just uh, continue with the original uh, dense reconstruction, right? They are just like for identifying which things have changed and you can but just associate them with your maps. They are for thing. identifying which things have changed between frames, right? You have usually these, uh, or between short times, so you have these buffers that essentially fill up and if you have an intensity change that is large enough, you fire with an event, right? But if I come back to the same room in 15 minutes, the events generated may not at all be correlated with the events generated when I was here now, right? So this is like this long-term data association for the short term, I think event cameras are fantastic. They are very lightweight and will probably um, be there eventually for the motion detection. For the long term, I don't quite see how they address our problem. Hey, uh, really great talk. Um, I saw the in your uh, talk abstraction, you mentioned that your actionable uh, SIM representation can be used to gather data, uh, which I think not mentioned a lot in the talk, but i just curious that, do you think um, which one is the future that robot collects data for robot learning or uh, learning from human collected video? Which one is more doable like in, for future? Um. <clears throat> Again, fantastic question. I think it was alluding a bit to the problem that you're talking about in the last piece of work where we do this uh, active learning sort of online, or this autonomous domain adaptation. And the scalable way is definitely to do it uh, autonomously. There's this entire field um, in computer vision and learning that's called active learning, which is usually um, you get a bunch of data samples, and then your method essentially tells the annotator, these are the 10 frames that if you annotate them will help me the most to make a, a better network. If you actually also tried this, the robot gathers a lot of data and then says, hey, can you annotate these 10 frames for me? 
um, but it's definitely not scalable. I think like everything that is really adaptive needs to be self-supervised, or at least uh, to a large part self-supervised to scale to really large data sets. This is, we try to, this is why we try to do this uh, autonomously. Does this answer your question or? Yeah, maybe for example, I, I do feel like data is very important for robotics and uh, I heard some uh, like robot companies, they use their robot to collect data. And uh, I think for the other part uh, in like uh, robot research, they like they try to use human videos. So this is uh, like something I want to learn more that we should use robot to learn uh, to collect data or use human videos. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, excellent question. I mean, in industry, what a lot of times happen is uh, you have all this data to train really, really big models, but then you run into a corner case, right? So what happens, you throw your engineering team on that corner case, they look at the data, they annotate it, you fine tune your model, that problem is fixed, you run into the next corner case. So this is essentially how autonomous driving has been going for a long while. And they got really, really far doing that, but the question is, will you ever arrive at a point where there's no more corner cases? And in particular, um, this is usually also specific to some sort of sensor setup or robot, right? So if we come up with a learning framework that works on any robot, right? We've seen quite a bunch of different robots today. Then probably if the robot knows about its uh, specifics and how it can get our data to improve itself, this would be much more scalable than fine tuning for a specific kind of uh, setup. Thank you. Um, hello, I think I'm like really impressed by like just like the general scale and also like novelty of like all these projects and I'm curious like going along the lines of like the interplay of modules like has I guess like just the complexity and in integrating all of these parts have ever been like an issue and what kind of like work goes into like completing a project that is both novel and like highly complex. Um, again, excellent question. Um, the honest answer is yes, it is a, a limitation, and I was really only able to do all of this cool work on these different robots because uh, I was working in a large team with many people who specialized on uh, control and low-level attitude control and building these drones and all these kinds of things, and it would have never been possible to do it on my own. Um, the other thing is also, for many, many robotics um, parts, there are some solutions um, out there that work reasonably well that you can try off the shelf. So we definitely suggest um, you focus in on one key aspect. Maybe you want to make um, the planning better and you take an off the shelf solution for um, state estimation, mapping, and these kinds of things to yeah, be able to focus a bit more. As you work on more projects, you might be able to integrate them well together. So with most of the things that I showed today, actually paid quite a bit of attention to make the software um, nice, maintainable, extendable, and this did pay off in the long run. We had many follow-up projects where we could use these sort of off-the-shelf starting point. But uh, integration is a problem, and I would recommend you don't try to build a robot bottom-up and try to solve all of robotics, but like draw boundaries on this is what I want to do research on, and as you do more research, maybe you touch more modules. Thanks. Great talk, and I'm wondering because you're talking about like learning the history of things and also predicting the future and these kind of temporal information, like in your mapping, could you help with like predicting repeating sequence coming up, like repeating setting of the room, and would that help with giving better prior or that doesn't really help because your system is really adaptive to what's changing? Absolutely love this question. This is exactly where we're planning um, to go. So the key idea is really, for example, um, this idea of specializing to your environment, right? For example, if a robot is in one place and it's always like the same red cup, it's the owner's favorite cup and it moves all the time, right? You should be able to build a much better prior on that cup is likely to move and maybe even where. Um, we are not there quite yet because just these uh, long-term consistent representations weren't really um, there, so we focused on building those first. But uh, I do believe there's a lot of promise in that direction, and we hope to be able to make robots that can actively detect changes and improve from their past experience. That sounds great. Thank you.